where accelerates technological change. World War I would not be the first major conflict to be fought in what historians popularly refer to as the modern technological age, and always the first to see the use of the airplane. Because of the geographical expanse of the war, reliance on newer and better technologies and the resulting casualty rate would be parallel. The development of the airplane moved from its leisurely pace development of the 1903 Wright Flyer through the years leading up to the beginning of the war. Rapid <coughs> innovations beginning in 1914 would launch it to become a highly lethal and indispensable machine of war. In the four long years that marked World War I, the attempt to gain the initiative rapidly advanced the scope of aeronautical technology and the application of the airplane for the battlefront. Within this larger framework, some lesser known advancements are worthy of closer examination as they reveal innovations and the surge of technological advances that would cast a long shadow over the future of warfare. Professor Junkers. I'm much impressed with the energy and devotion to aviation and aviation technology uh, that came out of his brain trust and the group of engineers that he worked with in Germany uh, up until the 1930s when he was deposed from the company by the Nazis. His first effort in this regard would come in 1912, to be exact, with Reisner in building the, um, the, or the dock. And this was a Conard all-metal airplane. It was proof of concept. Uh, he came up with the metal structure, and uh, Reisner came up with the, the design. I don't think there was any success in the flight, but um, it, it gave him food for thought, so much so that he decided to get involved in aviation. And as with any good engineer, he applied himself to understand the requirements so he worked diligently with wing design, body shape, built a wind tunnel, um, built a, uh, a laboratory. Uh, did calculations. Uh, shared data with the Gottingen group on aeronautical coefficients. And as you can see, uh, there were quite a number of different uh, wing designs and profiles that, and wing and bodies that were uh, looked at. Uh, this is just a sampling. In 1915, built, constructed, tested, and flown all-metal uh, cantilever wing airplane. Uh, the metal that was used was steel, and the type of steel that was used was the type of steel that was used in the building of transformers because they did not have the type of aluminum necessary because he knew that the weight was a factor, but they the type of aluminum it needed, you couldn't get a hold of, so they used the, this transformer steel. So it was rather heavy, but the airplane performed really well, uh, all considered. And we think, uh, were impressed enough by it. You have to remember, in 1915, this is a radical 
design departure from anything else that's out there. Another view of it. So much so that they uh, authorized him to build a military version. And so there was a series of aircraft uh, which would <coughs> be experimental <coughs> to develop a, um, a metal uh, uh, or cantilever wing and no wires. Uh, so he had the belief of uh, monoplane, low-wing monoplane, mid-wing monoplane uh, designs. Uh, and so there was a series of them that were gone through uh, during that time of experimentation. And this is one of them. But what they were, and here's another one, what they were really interested in was for him to build a battle plane. And so they uh, had him build what would be known <coughs> as the J-1. And if you notice here, he has it listed as J-4 because that's the Junkers J-4 as opposed to the J-1. The J actually is not the true designation. There's a, uh, it, there's a misunderstanding there. There's another German character that looks like a J, uh, and that was what people referred to as the J uh, series, um, but it's really not. I, I have to get the <coughs> specifics of that and not. I'm not talking about the Junkers, I'm talking about the uh, So the construction is metal tube. Uh, here he's using aluminum, and it's uh, very thin. It's less than a quarter of an uh, eighth of an inch uh, thickness of metal. It's easily uh, damaged. Um, and so the handling of the aircraft on the ground, uh, you can only handle certain areas uh, so as not to uh, damage the uh, corrugated aluminum. And this is the prototype. Uh, and so this is the first one built in the, uh, the bathtub, if you will, compartment from the engine to the gunner is reinforced steel. And except for uh, high caliber uh, direct uh, fire, uh, it's impervious. So it, it serves well as uh, as ground observation. Low. Uh, it's not a, a ground attack aircraft because it doesn't have uh, downward firing guns, and it's uh, ground observation contact patrol, if you will, um, and. It's not very fast, but it's very durable, and it can remain out in the weather. Uh, the, because of the metal skin, uh, there's not a problem of fabric deterioration. And it's successful. So with the uh, success of that, uh, they decide to let him develop a low-wing monoplane version of an attack, a ground attack, and they come up with the, uh, he comes up with the CL-1. And this sees use on the Eastern Front, interestingly enough, uh, at, at the end of the war. And, and again, it, visually, for my eyes, and I hope for yours, it, this aircraft does not look like your typical World War One aircraft. It has many of the features that you would see uh, you know, later on, low-wing monoplane, uh, clean lines, no uh, uh, control wires. It can stay out of the weather. It's rather robust. It comes up with the D-1, which is his answer as a uh, 
a fighter and uh, <coughs> ground attack. And it's also uh, uh, produced, uh, but it's too late in the war to see deployment, and you won't see it being used until uh, post-war in the uh, ongoing conflicts in the East. But his interim designs, and there are many designs that he's doing, just as we see with a lot of aircraft designers at that time, are carried over quickly until after the war. And so the F-12 is something that he's designed during the war period and that is, becomes the first transport aircraft uh, specifically for civil transport in Germany. Now, this is a wind tunnel model of a Junkers bomber from World War I. Yeah. And uh, it has many of the visual clues that would suggest it as a 1930s uh, bomber. This is not something you would expect to see during uh, World War I. Uh, retain that shape and the wing form and the body in your mind for a moment. Bear with me. So here's the R1 project, right? It's a very large wing. And he comes up with the G series transport airplane in the 1930s and he's flying that then. So there's obviously a a continuation of that idea. Fokker is a, intersects with Junkers during this unhappy marriage period between Junkers and Fokker, uh, which the Germans decide that they two need to get together and create a company. Fokker knows how to get things built, Junkers has great ideas. Let's put them together. Farker is sterile. He's not producing aircraft that we need. Junkers can. Maybe we can get some magic going here. Junkers detests Farker for the type of entrepreneur that he is. Farker is ambivalent, sees Junkers as the uh, someone that he can learn something from. So what is he learning from? He's learning the construction of uh, using aluminum and metal for wing <coughs> forms. And in this case, <coughs> Falker is unsuccessful when he's trying it on some of his aircraft. This is a wing failure in using uh, ribs and wing. And here's an example of what Falker has learned and what he is beginning to apply. And I posit that the V1 is a direct relationship between Falker's uh, time with the Junkers and what he's learned. Because he has flown the Junkers aircraft and he knows a good aircraft because Falker is a pilot test pilot. Junkers is not a pilot, but Falker is, and he has flown Junkers aircraft, and he's impressed by what he's flown and knows. And he develops his V1 project, uh, a large, thick cantilever wing, no wires, uh, as proof of concept to see if he can do something with Junkers ideas, with his ideas married together, He's using a welded stool, the steel tube, which he's very familiar with already at this point. But the wing is wood. That's a happy man. And so there's your V1. And what's well, a V2 with a thin lock engine? Right. But that's the V1 next to 
what you will become the triplane. Large departure. And it's the it's the cantilever wing <coughs> that's reapplied in a more traditional sense because there are aspects about the aileron controls on the wing tips that are not working as well as you would hope. But the proof of concept with the thick wing has proven itself and he's moving along. But then the Germans demand a triplane and Fokker, the businessman, says, well, that's not really what I had in mind, but if that's what you want, I'll, I'll adjust. Could you go back one picture, please? Oh, yeah. The plane on the left, the, the V1, as you say? Uh, it's V2. I don't see any V2-ing struts on the end. You know? And from what I've read, the DR1 didn't actually need inner plane struts. It was the pilots that demanded them, but that... First plane DR1, I don't see him. No, no he doesn't bother with them. He doesn't, he doesn't think they're needed. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and, <coughs> and this is part of the reasons why that is on uh, this, in my reading, is there was um, a bit of vibration on the wings. A vibration on the wings. wings. And so this is to uh, help stabilize them. But you don't have the, the, the wires. And it I kept them the stiff and more uh, nervous. As usual, Fokker aimed to please. Yeah. So, Fokker is an entrepreneur, he's an opportunist, there's the written story of how they developed the synchronizer within 48 hours, single-handedly winning the war. No, no, I'm sorry. But what he has done was take ideas that had been developed by the French and not by the Germans because the design that he is using in his first gear is the French design. Look it up, John. It's the French design. Even though Franz Schneider sued him for... Right, because for it's, the, it's, the second, it's the second version of his synchronizer, because this is a departure from his first. There's two different types of synchronizers that he develops. And the first one is based off of the French one, which is pre-war. And the second one is the one that he's developed off of the Schneider because it's a better uh, uh, interrupted gear. It was Swiss. Uh, thank you. So we're talking about interrupted gears. And so this individual here plays prominence in that. I know he's not a salesman. He's a veritably a genius an engineer and a scientist. George Constantinescu, Romanian. Yeah. And this showing here, as best as I can understand from what I'm visually seeing here and interpreting, and this is my supposition, is the non-compressibility of fluids. And Constantinescu has, has a, um, developed a new idea of the theory of sononicity, which is the transmission of waves uh, through any object, whether it be solids or liquids. And its corollary is the way that electricity works and the way that uh, audio uh, uh, waves work. Well, the, sim the simple analogy is actually water hammering your pipes. So what he has done is he has worked, and help me with the name of the English major in... Calper? Thank you. Uh, and has developed a dramatically different interrupter system that uses his theory and his principles of synchronicity, the transmission of sonic waves through liquid, and you can't see it on the bottom because it's moved out, um, the screen, but the cam uh, generates to a um, 
system, a pulse that is then fed down uh, the hydraulic fluid. And the hydraulic fluid is used because it can be sealed and closed and will not evaporate and hopefully doesn't leak because it's a sealed system. But we'll send this pulse down, which then is received by a receiving uh, a unit, which interprets that pulse and activates uh, the uh, interrupter system to stop the uh, machine gun from firing at the propeller's uh, arc. And the rate of fire is increased by this system. Uh, so there's a higher fire rate from using the CC gear than any other gear. There are no moving parts, so it's not going to break down due to that and it's uh, easier to time and develop once you understand it. And so there are uh, you know, aspects of this that go beyond my full understanding, but uh, I believe that I've given you the basic uh, uh, outline of how it worked. Uh, it's used by both the British and the Americans on our aircraft, uh, it works very well with our Marlins. Uh, also, the Bristol and the uh, SE-5A. Right. By the way, did he say Cowper or Collie? I think it was Cowper. It was uh, Major Georgie Collie who okay. applied it to Thank the you. British. Cowper was working for Sopliff okay. and designed their mechanical interrupter gear. So here is uh, what a full system for a uh, uh, twin gun would look like. Uh, with the control on the uh, on the control call uh, for firing, and in the national collection, we're very fortunate that we have um, pretty much uh, almost an entire system. Um, and it was used up until World War II by the British on the Gladiator. Uh, the same system, so it's it's pretty interesting to see that uh, that it was a, that much of a successful system. Yes, it, was plasma physics a field of study back then? Because this is basically plasma physics, isn't it? Pulses through water. This is pulses through anything. Okay. Sonicity. If you look it up, it's a really interesting. It's a another uh, side branch in physics. He, uh, after the war, he applies his designs of synonicity to develop a uh, automobile that does not require uh, uh, gears uh, uh, for shifting. Uh, it's a trans... It's Continuously varied yeah, transmission. No clutch, no gears. Uh, it doesn't do well. Uh, he's promised some really big money and funding from an American company, I believe GM, uh, and uh, they uh, kind of like renege at the last minute, but have, have the, uh, the rights to it, so it doesn't go anywhere. But it is used still to today in drilling. Um, because of the nature of, uh, of uh, high pressure uh, uh, head uh, drilling. Um, so it's an interesting uh, extension of his designs. Uh, lastly, we come upon uh, this um, noted American uh, general, George Owen Square. Uh, people think that his name is Squire, but it's not, it's Square, and he said so himself. Uh, he's the first PhD uh, in the United States military, uh, Johns Hopkins, uh, in electrical engineering. He's an uh, avid 
um, enthusiast of uh, the opportunities of aviation. Uh, he sees communications as an important uh, part of, so he becomes the head of the Signal Corps. Uh, he encourages uh, the rights uh, in their development of aviation for the military. Uh, he's the first military officer of rank to fly um, and with the rights. And this is uh, nothing to do with Square. This is everything to do with uh, communications from the air. This is um, McCurdy, who's a well-known figure from Canada, who's flying uh, uh, Curtis uh, designs uh, and his own based upon Curtis. And he's involved in air races. And one of the things that he does is in, in the uh, uh, pre-war years is first transmission, as far as we can tell, and yet to be uh, found that's not the case, the transmission of uh, spark radio from the air to the ground um, without uh, specific messages being sent, just proof of concept that you could send a message from an airplane to the ground is done, and this is in the National Collection. Uh, this is built by Rosen, uh, and it's flown by McCurdy uh, in New York City uh, at Sheepshead Bay. Uh, what year is that, John? 19... 1910 or 11, I forget which. <clears throat> so Spark is the form of communication that is prevalent at the time, uh, because the vacuum tube triode uh, has not been invented yet. There are advancements towards that, but it hasn't happened. So Marconi has got the monopoly on wireless throughout the world because it's his, his company. The problem with Spark, and this is a World War I Spark unit, French design uh, that both the British and the Americans use. Okay, that's Spark. The problem with Spark is it's an undampened wave, and when you have multiple Spark signals that are transmitted simultaneously, it's across the entire spectrum, and they step on each other. So if you've ever tried talking in someone with a CB, and you have multiple people trying to talk CB at the same time, you step on <coughs> one another, you interrupt, and you break up the transmission. Well, it's the same thing with, but worse, with the spark, because you can't differentiate at all what's going on. And so... Spark is not the way, uh, but it is the prevalent uh, form of communication that's being used at the time. And it's not until 1914 that the, the development of the vacuum tube reaches a point where AT&T, Western Union, Western Electric, Electric, Western Electric <coughs> buys the rights to it, develops it on their own, <coughs> for the purpose of transmission of telephone across the United States because what happens is when you try to send a telephone signal down a wire, you have degradation and after, uh, I don't remember how many miles it is, maybe 100, 200 miles, the signal degrades to the point where it can't carry so there's no transcontinental telephone calls, no transatlantic telephone calls, it's all telegraphy. But with the vacuum tube, it becomes an amplifier and you can build repeating stations so that low signal is then carried to the next station and the next and the next. And in 1914, to open up 
the uh, San Francisco Exposition, AT&T does the first transcontinental telephone call. And they're using, tel they're using tubes, and they have the monopoly on it. So they know that they can do this. So it's not a far distance between sending down a signal down a wire and sending it across the air, and they know it too. Well, this individual, <coughs> Colonel Clarence Culver, is at the McCurdy fly over in New York and sees the spark, and he is a believer that there is a better way of communication comes 1914. He's sure of it. He's part of the Signal Corps. He's part of the program that's developing wireless telephone communication from the air to the ground, from the ground to the air. And these are the test flights done down in Texas. And here he is with, this is, this is an old style carbon element microphone. It's not a moving coil. And he's got it strapped to his chest. And he's got earphones on in his helmet so he can hear. And he's communicating with the ground and it works. And that's a major step forward. And General Square is all for it. And he knows that the war in Europe is going to include America soon enough. He understands this. He's brought over by the, as a military attaché, the Court of St. James in England, and he is one of the few individuals who, of foreign nationality, is permitted at the front before the United States gets to the war, where he's in the trenches observing what's going on as far as communications, and he is held over for a second year, unprecedented as a military attaché, at the request by the Brits to do this. And he knows what the problems of the war are, is the ability to communicate from the front lines to the command. Because command and control is a problem. And how does he know that? Because his time during the Spanish-American War was spent in developing command and control. If you read his history and his experiences, he understands what the premise is and the requirements and modern warfare requires command and control through communications at a higher level than what is being done. So, he's pulled all the punches and, I mean, pulled all the stops and has Western Electric developed specifically radio telephone and wireless communication by telegraphy using vacuum tubes because he knows spark is not going to work and that vacuum tube because you can have uh, a very specific channel just as you tune to an AM channel 570, 640 you can tune with it a vacuum tube, you can set your tuning and you can transmit on, the, on specific frequencies. So for telegraphy it works and for uh, telephony it works. So in 1917 when the war, in the United States sends of the war, AT&T, Western Electric is building a small amount of tubes for themselves. The VT-2 and the VT-1, which are the transmitter-receiver triodes, are produced in 50,000 batch for the company because tubes are gone through, because they're constantly being used and replaced. By the end of 1918, they are producing one million tubes in a year. So my posit is, is that the, the advent of the modern electronics industry begins here.
because you go into mass production. There are radio telephone sets which are both send and receive, which is known as the SCR 68, and SCR could even mean, for some people, set complete radio or service core radio. I'm not really sure which is the correct one. There's a lot of people saying different things here, but this is a schematic. If you look at it, it's a very simple system, uh, and it is for radio telephone, and it's basically a AM transmitter and receiver because it's amplitude modulation, much as uh, in the same wavelength, by the way, as AM radio. It's in the 500s. And uh, one of the curious things is, is that the first units that are being used after the war to produce commercial radios uh, that are for commercial broadcasting are old surplus um, military systems. So perhaps AM radio begins in the low bands like that because of these systems. Well, this is a 68. We have one in the collection. We have actually a few of them in the collection now. Uh, you can see the VT1 and the VT2. Uh, this is an internal antenna here. Um, and the battery sits in here runs off of the battery, runs off of a generator, which feeds the battery and the recharge circuit. The way that the, uh, the pilot and the co-pilot, because this is intended for communication in observation aircraft, communicate, and if you've ever looked at the DH-4, the distance between the pilot and the co-pilot, uh, the pilot and the observer, sorry, is far enough that it's very hard to communicate and so with the headset and the microphone, using an intercom system, uh, which is a very simple dry cell battery system, I built one of these when I was in junior high school and I took a you know, shop class. We built these little, you know, home uh, uh, intercom systems that used to use some dry cells. And, um, and so here is a helmet from the collection with the earphone. And there's the microphone from the collection, and this is carbon. So it's not really good. This is 91st Aero Squadron. And he is putting on a microphone. And he's got earphones in that helmet. And he's going to put on a helmet with earphones. That's the same devil insignia we just saw. Yeah. So, so this, this goes along with what it was, you read in the Gorel report, uh, 2,500 of those uh, wireless uh, telephone units were built uh, and deployed to the front for testing. And whether they were used in combat, I haven't read, but they were flown at the front, front line. Uh, the pilots and the observers uh, made use of it. This is an Assomption 2A2. Um, they were used with DH-4s. They were used um, by the British as well. Um, so we know that it was used extensively for testing. Um, and had the war gone on for another year, there was a squadron that was in training in the United States that was a command and control squadron where the command pilot of the squadron, the squadron leader, would transmit verbal instructions to the rest of the squadron who had receivers but not transmitter units, which are these units, the 59 which are the receiver units and the 68s are the transmitter receiver to give instructions. So the squadron leader would receive instructions from the ground, he would relay it to the pilots in the squadron, and the squadron was developed as a command and control fighter squadron or reconnaissance group uh, as seen fit or bomber, uh, which is a very modern way of, of carrying out the warfare. So, we were just on the cusp of that in 
1918. And you can see it's a very simple design. Uh, two tubes and a heater tube. Uh, this is the uh, generator with a regulator tube. Uh, DH4, you would see the generator mounted here. These are, this is for heating the electric suits, and this, oh, this generator here is actually a uh, self-contained spark radio generator, uh, and not uh, one of you, you can see the same one over on the uh, SPAD, uh, 13, 16, 16 out, yeah, here. out here. Uh, one of the big problems the they problem had, one of the big problems they had with the uh, wireless uh, from the aircraft, even with two, was interference from the engine, and even more so with the spark radio. Uh, and so they tried shielding, and that improved the situation. So this is an example of some of that shielding. And this is the, uh, um, the ground station unit. These are pretty rare to, to find. This is in a private collection. Uh, and this would be used on the ground to transmit and receive from communication from the air. And this is a test setup and a ground station uh, uh, from that period. And here you go. President Wilson talking to an airplane, a pilot flying above Washington, giving instructions uh, to the pilot and um, verbal instructions, a radio telephone. Uh, this is shortly after the war. This is obviously, by use of magnification, I can see what unit it is. Um, and it's obvious that this is the same units, uh, same type of systems. The Brits are also using it. Actually, they developed their own uh, radio telephone very early. 1916, they've developed one. Uh, but it's not deployed for some reason. Uh, and when they get into the act of finally doing it, they're doing it as own defense for London. But they don't have the parts and the way to build them in country. So can you see who the manufacturer is here? It's General Electric, USA, are building it for the Brits. Um, and this is a receiver unit, and it's used in defense of London. Uh, so our F5L in the collection also has a radio telephone and telegraphy system in it. And this one is 10 times the power of the ones that were used by the Army. It's a completely different system. Uh, the tubes are made by General Electric. They are 50 watt tubes. The, the Army ones are 5 watt tubes. Um, and this radio telephone is sitting inside our F5L, as is you can see in this flying boat radio by the Marconi Wireless Telegraphy Company. Uh, as is the tuner. As is that right there is the microphone. And that's, we have another one of those in the system. And this is made by Magnavox. Uh, and um, how many of you have? heard of the company Magnavox? <laughs> okay, well, they become famous for building the first loudspeakers that are using moving coil. Uh, Mag or Vox is this magnetic fo focal amplification. They develop a, um, what, what I can best describe as a uh, Differential microphone. It's open back, and so the sound from the airplane entering the back 
uh, is canceled when it's combined with the sound leaking into the front uh, through a mechanical means rather than a, just a simple electrical means because it's not moving coil, uh, because the waveforms are slightly out of uh, phase. So if you take two waveforms of the same signal and you put them out of phase from one another and you combine them, the signal is canceled. So the voice comes through, but the noise doesn't. So it was a way of creating a noise-canceling microphone. And that's Magnavox. And we have a second one of these uh, units in the collection. And that one actually has the tube in it. And you can see the size of the tube. It's huge in comparison to the, uh, the one from the Western Electric. And those are out here on the floor now in a case. The cases I don't know has it out there, right? Yeah. yeah, down on that end. So we're we're not the only ones who are experimenting. This is a German system, uh, closed microphone. Uh, it's worn over the face. The receiver is in the face here to uh, permit. Uh, so yes, this is the Elephant Man version, um, but uh, it's headphone, and so they're very serious about it. And there's a very good book that's digitized, that's out there, it's all in German, on uh, radio communications by the German uh, air service, that's including the balloons, by Neumann, uh, and anyone wants the, the link to that, just let me know and I can send you uh, to that uh, Google Books. Uh, and it's, as I said, it's all in German, and there's quite a bit of good information in there. Uh, to wrap it up, what I will tell you is that radio telephone leads on, as I said, to the modern electronics industry. Uh, the development of the superheterodyne comes out of World War I. Whether it's French or American design, it's still in debate, but what it does do is it pro provides and Credit would be due, I believe, to Armstrong, an American, for coming up with the design. But the French say otherwise, and so did the courts, and there was a lot of back and forth, so it was partial share in, in that. But uh, what it does come up with is that during the period of radio, uh, the reason that modern radio works as well as it does, and that we can listen to stations in clarity, is we have the uh, superheterodyne uh, enabling and uh, um, uh, RCA makes a big deal of it. Uh, you know, the Super 8 uh, superheterodyne receiver. So, um, but my point is, is that uh, uh, the technology leads to other uh, technologies. And, uh, that's it. Yeah. So I'll take questions.